our next panel uh, that we have will be discussing uh, elected officials and uh, folks who are um, non-religious, atheists, uh, who have gotten elected um, to public office, uh, what that looks like, and uh, you know how, how exactly that happens, because I know that this is a topic that many folks in our community are very interested in. Um, and uh, is something that we certainly need to do a better job of, uh, of getting elected. We need, we need folks in public office. Uh, we're really fortunate to be joined by some, uh, not just elected officials, but some people who are working to get people elected, uh, which is another core component of this, um, including uh, the, the moderator of this panel, uh, my friend, Sarah Levin. Um, and I think we can bring Sarah up on stage here in just a moment. Um, Sarah is the founder and principal of uh, Secular Strategies and a former uh, staffer with the Secular Coalition for America. Uh, Sarah is also the co-chair, I believe that's right, of the uh, Democratic National Committee's Interfaith Council. I think I got all that terminology correct. Uh, yeah. And uh, <laughs> and worked very closely uh, with the uh, Biden-Harris campaign uh, to help launch uh, Humanists for Biden and has been very instrumental in uh, making sure that atheists have a voice in the political process and in the campaign. Um, and we're just very fortunate to have Sarah um, as our moderator for this panel. So I will turn things over to her. Um, looks like her camera may have shut off there, but I will uh, turn things over to Sarah. Wonderful. Well, I'm really excited to be here. Thank you all for um, taking the time to tune into this panel because it's really important that we talk about uh, representation in public office. And so I'm really excited to introduce the panelists we have today. I'm going to start by introducing Arizona State Representative Athena Salman, who is born and raised in Arizona to an immigrant family from Mexico, Germany, and Palestine. Her early gratitude for the rights we often take for granted inspired her defense, inspired her to, her to defend those who are most vulnerable, including forcing prisons to supply feminine hygiene products to incarcerated women by sparking national outrage when she raised that issue. Um, she also um, has unapologetically stood with educators uh, during uh, hashtag red for ed, um, having herself benefited from a public education. And now she's fighting for the health, safety and lives of frontline workers in our communities during the COVID-19 pandemic. So she truly is a fantastic um, advocate, not just for our community, but for the folks that she serves in Arizona. She's an excellent elected official um, that we can really uh, take, take from her example, um, because certainly what we'll be doing today is hoping to convince some of you who are tuning in to consider running for office because you really can make a difference. Uh, Representative Solomon is currently the Democratic ranking member of the Arizona House Government and Elections Committee and the former Democratic Whip. She's the only openly atheist woman in the Arizona legislature. So really glad to have her here. We also have Karina Quintanilla, who is a member of the City Council for, for Palm Desert, California. She's been a Coachella Valley resident since 1984 and has lived in Palm Desert since 2002. After graduating from Cathedral City High School, excuse me, in 1997, she attended uh, the University of California, Riverside, where she received her bachelor's degree in Spanish. And in 2012, she completed coursework for a credential program to teach Spanish. And she's currently in pursuit of a master's in public administration. So you can continue your education while also serving for office. And excited to hear more about that. Um, she's currently, um, oh, excuse me, Karina's passion for translating came from her being her family's translator since the age of five, she became aware of the impact of culturally competent translations and how her linguistic abilities could serve others. And Karina has put them to use in translating documents and two books and um, certainly uses that experience um, in education to connect with uh, her constituents as well. Um, and so in, also in 2015, Karina was selected by Hispanis Organized for Political Equality for their Leadership Institute, where she honed her community engagement and leadership skills. Uh, it's a great example of how you can get involved and on the path to elected office and get involved locally. Um, so Karina and her fellow participants lobbied state senators in Sacramento to pass Senate Bill 4, Health for All, which brought accessible health care to all Californians, as well as Senate Bill 
2015, which redirected unused funds uh, for Cal Granite scholarships. So again, um, get involved and you might end up running for office. Um, so, and finally, I'm really excited to introduce Ron Millar, who's the political impact coordinator for the Center for Free Thought Equality, which is the advocacy and political arm of the American Humanist Association. He runs the Free Thought Equality Fund, whose mission is to achieve equality for the non-theist community by increasing the number of open humanists and atheists in public office at all levels of government. Ron was instrumental in the announcement by Representative uh, Jared Huffman, uh, who I think you all heard from uh, yesterday. Um, and that, and he really worked with the congressman um, to announce his um, humanist and agnostic identity um, and in um, establishing the Congressional Free Thought Caucus, which was really a huge moment for the secular community politically to have that kind of representation in Congress. And so those are our panelists today, really excited to um, start uh, we still have some of our panelists logging in, so I'm going to do things a little bit out of order and start with you, Ron, before we get to our elected officials. Um, so, um, one of my my general question for you is, what is the um, what is the landscape? Where do we currently stand on representation among both candidates and elected officials? What trends are you observing? Sure. Thank you, Sarah, and thanks to the American Atheists for having me on um, your conference. Um, when I came on board uh, with the Center for Free Thought Equality and started running our PAC, the, the Free Thought Equality Fund, we knew of five state legislators who identified with our community and another equal number of local um, elected officials at that time. So, I mean, obviously we were horrendously underrepresented, um, but then we started reaching out to people and you know, one of the big breaks we had, as Sarah was saying, was um, you know when we were sending out our candidate questionnaires to the various candidates, uh, Jared Huffman uh, returned it with a sort of interesting idea on you know when we asked about the religion question. So we followed up with emails with him, and then eventually had dinner with him, uh, Royce Beckart and myself, uh, and Congressman Huffman, and he said you know that he was willing to announce as a humanist. Um, and agnostic, which you know we hadn't had anybody representing us in Congress uh, since 2007, when Pete Stark um, announced you know that he did not believe in a higher power. Um, he was the first member of Congress ever to make that announcement, um, and he left con Congress, excuse me, in um, 2012. So, so you know it was great to have uh, uh, Representative Huff Huffman come on board. We made the announcement, got some decent press about it. Um, and that was in 2017. So, you know, we went through the, the election cycle with that. And um, right now we've been focusing on um, state legislatures because, you know, we've been reaching out to Congress since 2014 and Jared Huffman is the only one who um, openly uh, identifies with the atheist and humanist community. So we figured let's reach out to those 7,000 other elected officials out there who represent us at the state level. And so again, we started with five um, in 2016, and now we're to a little over 60 who identify with this. So it's a huge increase, um, but again, you know, we're still severely underrepresented. We need you know, 1,500 folks to 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 match our our represent representation of the in the general public. So we've got a lot of work to do. Um, and the other thing that was great with um, Representative Huffman, as you know, um, he got such great feedback from his colleagues um, that uh, he, he announced in 2017 that he was a member of our community. And then in early 2018, he said, hey, come have dinner at our townhouse. There's so many folks who congratulated me on, on my announcement that we want to form the Congressional Free Thought Caucus. And that was just you know, amazing. And so, you know, that was formed in 2018, started out with um, five members, now we're up to 15. So again, the, the environment is right for us to, to really start moving out um, and, and getting more people to embrace the atheist and humanist community and to run openly um, as, uh, as candidates. And so just, um, you know, some information in 2014, when um, the PAC start, first started endorsing people, it endorsed 18 candidates. Um, in 2020, we were just a little under 200 candidates. Now that also includes allies, but it's um, we're about 60-40, I think, with um, you know, members of our community compared to allies. So it's still a huge number of our community running for office. Um, 
and a lot of most of them are first time candidates. So it's giving them great experience so that then they, they can move on to run again if they weren't successful the first time. And we represent at the um, state legislature. I think we have represent we have representation in 24 states and um, you know, and it's in some states where you wouldn't expect. We have a state rep in Utah, um, a state rep in Nebraska, and a new state senator in North Carolina. So we're, you know, we're building representation. Uh, we're getting people visible, and um, you know, we just have to be supportive. And of course, at the Center for Free Thought Equality, we have a list of all those elected officials. So please, um, you know, invite them to to your events. Get to know them, and and you know, support them. Absolutely. Thanks, John. Just just to clarify, that 60-40, is that about 60% openly non-theist and 40% ally or the other way around? No, uh, uh, at least 60% members of our community. That's fantastic. That's great. Um, so uh, what you said about uh, running, at, more people running as openly non-religious and supporting them, it's a great segue to my question for council member Quintanilla. Do we have you here? If not, I'll, I'll ask Ron another question. We'll just, <laughs> ah, she's yeah, here she goes. Just a little bit of, of tech issues this morning. I am <laughs> so thankful to be here. And I'm so thankful to have a face-to-face -face with Ron. It was wonderful to get a chance to chat with you during the, the um, election process and candidacy. And it's a privilege and pleasure to be here with everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are and whatever time you're listening. Thank you so much for being here. So I'm gonna, if you don't mind, I'm gonna jump right in and ask you a question. Absolutely, um, go ahead. So what led you to decide to run for office as an open atheist and why was it important to you to be open about your atheist identity? Well, for me, it, it wasn't so much that it, it even was an issue. Um, there was bigger issues that led me to become a candidate, um, but it was, something that I realized was going to be something I needed to be prepared to talk about. And I, I had very clear ideas that for me, I needed to be able to explain to folks that I'm still the same person that my grandmother raised going to church. I just stopped going to the physical building. I'm still the same person that has the idea of what is right, what is wrong, based on these these social contracts and agreed upon norms that, that we all still hold. And the idea of being a good person in this lifetime because there is no promise of a next lifetime. And that these are humanist values that I still want to be sure that our, our neighbors don't go hungry, that our neighbors are, are with shelter and, and with all of the adequate needs and that those are a principle of humanity and not of a political party and not of a theology. No one has ownership of being kind and boiling it down to the simplicity of that and not allowing anyone to get bogged down to, well, wait, 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 you said you don't go to church anymore. Did it ever come up on the campaign or in uh, conversations with your constituents? You know, I think that because of COVID, it, it really um, allowed me to campaign without going to a church and without um, a, a lot of the campaigns normally that are grassroots do involve churches and and you'd almost be foolish not to go to it you know, to, to fail to to visit a church and and reach out to community organizations and I knew that was something I, I wanted to do um, I, I still know where I attended you know close by Father Lincoln is still a good member of the community and I recall him seeing him do good works out of the frock you know, it's not just for show because he was on display as Father Lincoln, um, being a genuine good person and, and knowing that he's somebody that I could build coalition with. And so knowing that some people see um, somebody that says I'm secular or I'm agnostic and they think automatically somebody that hates all religions, somebody that's antithetical or anti-church. And it's a whole entire soup of ingredients of who non-believers are and being able to um, identify who I am as an individual independent of faith. You know, you, you don't uh, take away from my background the fact that I don't have a master's degree in aerospace engineering. That's just not something that's a part of who I am, but it doesn't mean that I'm not equipped for this other opportunity to, to lead people and to speak for my community. That's great, thank you. I mean, we, we really want to be in that place where it's not where it's a non-issue. Where maybe if it comes up, it's getting up. 
to explain. Um, I'm, when, when we do get Representative Salman on here, she might have a different experience given um, where she's run for office. Um, so uh, we're really, uh, it's, it's great to hear that you're, you've had that experience and, and can be your authentic self because it really should be a non-issue, right? I did, and I think part of that also is is given that the the intersection of where the Venn diagram is of who I am and who the demographics were of the district in which I ran. Um, and so I'm really looking forward to the breakout session later when we talk about the, the affinity group for Latinos and Latinx, because there is a large idea of how can you separate your culture? Because for some, for some people, the concept that we can't trust you if you don't go to our sacred spaces. This is how we know that you subscribe to our cultural norms and you are truly one of us. And what happens when you start getting excluded from family gatherings because you're now a non-believer or, or you disrespected an institution that great grandma held sacred and how those things then translate and have a ripple in the community for how you engage and word of mouth. Um, so I, I think it just really depends on the individual community. And in Arizona, obviously, that's a, a whole more a, a conservative hub. But we were able to to make some change in Palm Desert and Palm Desert is starting to turn blue. And in this district in particular, um, I unseated a two term incumbent and uh, actually garnered more votes than President Biden in my district, <laughs> becoming the first Latina and the youngest woman to be elected to Palm Desert City Council. That is and I'm absolutely not right. sure if the first secular American, I haven't taken a poll, um, but uh, the current mayor is a, a retired minister um, and my campaign manager was a retired priest. And he says he fell in love and lost his job. He got married and lost his job. And he he's an MFT, very um, warm and receptive. And so it was, it, it did kind of, ask me for filters I wasn't prepared for when he was so excited to prepare an invocation. A beautiful invocation and I was just, you know, he's like, I want to do a prayer for you. And I I thought, is this my time to say, Charlie, I, I uh, do I say it? Do I not say it? This is a man who's 90 years old and has marched with Dr. Martin Luther King and has been working with civil rights and then that's the moment we as, as atheists or non-believers or secular agnostics, wherever we are on the range of non-belief, do we say something? Do I identify? Does it matter? Is this the moment? Will it lead to a conversation I don't have time to engage in? And sometimes we have to almost wonder, is it worth changing the dynamic of this individual relationship in this moment with the ask to say, ah, you know, I'm not so sure about a prayer because I know what it meant to him. And I, I'll, he did a, an invocation that was very, um, it was non-denominational and it was very inclusive and beautiful and a real spirit of change. And so that made it, that made it a little, little easier for me to not even make it an issue. Um, but I think that the fear is that when anybody that has a platform says anything about I am a non-believer when we are asked to take an oath of office and are asked to pledge allegiance to the flag with the under God words added later because we know that's not original. So there is an expectation of things, but I think people also expect that their um, elected officials look like them and think like them. And so while running, there was a woman who was so offended that I dared to insinuate that I had a different experience with law enforcement than she did, even though we live less than a mile away. And to be able to say, I have white passing privilege. I know I, I am not dark and easily identified as a, as a member of any ethnic group by my skin tone. And yet I've seen the way it does for others. And people were very offended at these insinuations. So whenever anybody stands up and says, I don't believe the same way as you do, I don't hold the same opinions, I think it can put people at a standoff. But it's time to now normalize. It's time to normalize that we don't have to subscribe to these things. And in the same way that before uh, people that were subject to, to abuse or sexual discrimination or any kind of discrimination would maybe hold their tongue and say, you know, I, I don't appreciate that term. How, how long did it take for people to stop using the N word, for example? 
It took for everyone to start saying, I'm not comfortable with that word. And everybody normalizing that that social construct around that word was gone. It will take a lot of us to do the work to normalize a secular existence and not having to in include a deity in every part of, of life and make it easier to separate uh, religious institutions, uh, being able to donate pieces of art and have them on display in, in uh, public spaces that are, that are secular spaces and government spaces. So we have to start, and I have become more cognizant of in those moments when I have to choose that filter, again, is it time to potentially change this relationship or is it time to change a mind? And, and we, as, as uh, we start seeing that there are more and more numbers of nuns, there are growing numbers of non-affiliated individuals and we need to start finding each other so that we can feel safer and saying, I, I don't identify with being religious. I gave up giving stuff up for Lent a long time ago. Then I gave up Catholicism and then I never looked back. I, I really want to go a little bit deeper on that um, example you gave of do, do I say something? Do I not? Is this the moment? I really related to that because I've been in that situation so many times. I think a lot of folks listening have, especially if they do any sort of interfaith work and if they're in political spaces. So I'd love to hear more about how did you navigate that moment? He did end up giving the invocation was their conversation before or after, and, and how, how have you kind of navigated this in politics? Well, he sent a beautiful invocation, but then because of COVID, we ended up going backwards into more restriction and we were not able to do any sort of gathering. It was a Zoom swearing in at the council meeting and there was not anything specific that was done. So we said there would be something in the future and, and then maybe that would be the opportunity to do that. But I had... Um, somebody share with me a land invocation and i'm not sure if you are familiar with them and uh in my chaos this morning i wasn't able to get it pulled up so i'll do that while we while we chat but a land invocation is essentially um honoring the indigenous people of the land in which you're gathering and by doing that recognition um it kind of takes it away from whichever group is is wanting to honor their uh, religious tradition over another because it kind of takes turn in, in rotating. But then at what point it can be uncomfortable for somebody to ask, well, what about us that don't want that space acknowledged? Can we just sit in silence? Some people may not want that. Silence is a painful, uncomfortable psychological issue for some folks where they feel they must say space. For others, silence means you've done something wrong and you're being shunned. So it's difficult to ask um, space for, for folks that may not be familiar with it. But the land acknowledgement kind of allows you to remove that. Um, and um, shifts away from a prayer um, and just says, we are on Kauia land, their ancestors were here before we were, and removing it almost to before any of the religions were established or created, and saying the Kauia were on this land. And there's a whole process um, and a link that I'm still trying to get to, that you can find what land uh, people were, were, the tribal land. I'm sorry, my bird now wants attention. I have an Amazon parrot. Um, and so you can find, I can, I'll probably see if I can send it to you guys and, and find the link after, but the, um, found it, it lets you find the land that you're on and then allows for conversations to say, the people of this land aren't extinct and they exist and their traditions were wiped out but some of them still exist. There may be a small percentage. Right now we have a very limited number of, of native Kauia speakers. We, we call Talkwitz Canyon and Talkwitz Avenue, but it's Takits. And so we don't have cultural authenticity in these spaces. So by going back to the marginalized people and how colonialism continues to impact the health disparities, economic disparities, it shifts that whole entire thing away from, I wanted to talk about this. I wanted my prayer. I wanted to give this Bible verse because this resonates with me for this tradition. But we get to hold space to say, your religion came and wiped out indigenous cultures 
And I want to use this space to honor their religion, their tradition, their ancestors, and what they've been through and the small percentage of them that may still exist on this land. And it kind of shifts all of it away from the political sphere of yours over mine and church and state. But in some communities, that isn't um, very easy for, for folks to do. I, I love that because I, got, I have um, experienced uh, the, the, the choice to have, um, uh, you called it a, a land, um, uh, yes, the Native Land Acknowledgement, and the website is native-land.ca. Um, there's the parrot. And so from there, you can type in the address, and, and it specifically will say you are on the land, and it, it overlaps. And then it allows us educators for discussion to say, yes, we are in an area where there was a convergence of six different tribal groups that would gather because fish and whatnot and agriculture and ceremony and gathering and, and acknowledged that there was a division of land that came and a division of identities and separating of people where before we were all gathered. This morning I was watching um, an episode of a something on the Smithsonian Channel, and they were discussing Gobegli Tepe. And the idea that it has been so revolutionary that they just recently were able to acknowledge that anthropologists have had it wrong. Religion did not come after agriculture. It was believed that the transition from hunter-gatherers to agriculture then meant that steady food meant people had time to sit around and think about stuff because you weren't exhausted from toiling all day. But they found at Gobegli Tepe that people started gathering and then they started having to keep the food sources there because of how big the cities were. And religion then started to help assist people in the difficult times. And I have always felt that, that there's a psychological need to want to think that there is something bigger because life can make you feel helpless. And, and feeling that you are one single insignificant speck in the universe doesn't feel very comforting, but you wanna feel connected to something bigger. That's why we need affinity groups. That's why organizations like this matter. Because if you walk away from your faith, that could mean you're walking away from your whole entire church group, your community, your carpool, your babysitter, your family. And these spaces allow for people to find community because asking a question, why? And, but where does it say that and why? And being a young child and asking my grandmother, who's still a catechism instructor after all these years, I felt like a young Padawan asking Yoda. I was so outmatched, but I was getting answers to questions that at my developmental stage made sense. And when I would question things, I was kind of shunned or, or you know, topic changed. So when we start suppressing those, that curiosity and redirecting it, we're not doing anyone any favors, but in holding, as I mentioned, these land acknowledgements, we're opening these conversations back up to some of those conversations that get closed down of, but why? We're told that that um, Christianity came and civilized these, these heathen savages, and that's the answer that became acceptable, that Victor writes the textbooks. But these land acknowledgments let us go back and and strip some of that away. Absolutely, and I think I think um, especially when in our activism as atheists, it's it's very important that we stand with other religious minorities and um, the conception of indigenous beliefs and how they are tied to the land and not with a you know a sort of monotheistic conception of of gods. Um, is often left out and completely erased from the from the mm -hmm. conversation about religious freedom. Um, and there's, I think, there's an interesting um, intersection between religious freedom issues and environmental justice to a conversation to be had there. Yeah, so yeah. I'm really glad you're bringing this up because I think, you know, for for all the folks listening who are doing atheist activism, who are advocating for religious minority rights, you know, don't forget to include indigenous beliefs in that and recognize how. Uh, connection to land is is a part of that, especially given that for our community, climate justice and environment is, is a top issue. Absolutely. I was able to to bring some of these issues up. And as I mentioned, being the youngest woman elected, it presents a different concept as I'm talking to city staff and saying, you know, this this housing development, yes, we're talking this, but can we talk about two, three generations down in the future? We're in an area that has a lot of affluence and a lot of golf courses. 
I said, people that are inheriting these golf courses right now, they don't want to live at the golf course. They don't want to play golf. They want to sublet and use, let the HOA take care of a lot of the headaches and they'll do an Airbnb and make some money on the side. But we just recently learned, my mind was blown, right? I'm hearing about a surf park, a surf park in the desert. I was like, this is just ridiculous. Until I met with the developers and they told me that they're going to use 30 million gallons of water a year. I was like, clutch my pearls. But they're going to save 650 million gallons a year by removing the golf course and building this on top of it. And that was huge changing in, in, okay, well, there's a lot of golf courses out here. We need to turn that into affordable housing. But affordable housing looks different for the people now today in charge of the decision making instead of saying today's youth don't want to have kids. They know we're the state of the environment. They know the ecology of the planet. They know it's so unhealthy. And they're deciding, do I really want to bring more offspring onto this planet? They're looking for smaller homes. They're looking for sustainability. They're looking for ways to travel. They want to shut it down, put their stuff in storage and go travel and experience the world. They're not rooted in the same materialism that the the baby boomer generation was of, of consumption after so much struggle. This There was generational changes that were made after the depression. Having had so much poverty and scarcity, then having excess led to that boom in a lot of different ways. So the generational changes that have come with that, now there's been more scarcity. Today's kids grew up in the in seeing the, the great recession. It was just denial. It was the depression. We were just trying to pretend it wasn't so we could make ourselves feel better. But realistically, it was a real challenge to see that we need to engage more people. No matter what we're talking about, we need to engage more people to feel safe to come out and be in public spaces and say, I can be an effective elected official by advocating for these individuals. I can, I can present the idea that we can advocate and be sure that we don't just say all lives matter because there's a lot of people that get marginalized when we, when that gets pushed to the side. And it is very frustrating when you are the lone man out. Um, I mentioned to the city attorney that I, I'm okay being the thumb. We're a council of five. And a lot of the times I, I know I'm going to be out here on my own. And I'm okay with that because I need to to speak my mind, speak my peace and, and hold that space for the awkward conversations that the others may not want to have. But we have to be forward thinking, not just what makes sense now, but even three, four generations into the future. And seeing the growing trends and people walking away from religion, that means that we as city leaders have to start organizing and finding additional ways to engage people without thinking churches are a great way to do so. As we see people are leaving these organized structures, what are the increased ways that we find to do so? Will it be social media? Will it be additional gatherings? We don't know what the post-COVID world will look like. We're still re-envisioning, re-imagining, but I, I think that seeing that the world recovered from previous pandemics, we will get back to larger events, but more people are leaving religion, which then begs again, what kind of activities will be filling that space? Um, in, in some groups that I belong to, we discuss, hey, what are you doing with your Sunday morning instead of church? And there's opportunities to go and volunteer, but we can capture that. We can capture giving up that time and focusing that into a community driven effort. If before you were going to church and giving your money because you wanted to make the world a better place through your action and your prayer, you can still make the world a better place through your donations and your time and conversations. You're not speaking up to somebody hoping they listen to you. You can speak forward. You can speak on the phone. You can speak to your elected officials. You can communicate with people on Facebook. And we're just swapping that space. We're, we're taking that energy of wanting to make the world a better place, but we're taking it into tangible action with check marks and measurable dynamics where before people say prayer works, okay, yes, prayer works, but show me how you measure it. Show me how you measure it other than monetizing it. Um, that's the only way I think I've been able to try to measure prayer. That's great. You answered a lot of the questions I was going to ask you about governing. Um, so really appreciate you shedding light kind of how you approach these things. I want to turn to running for office because of what we're hoping um, uh, is that folks listening in will say, you know, I could do that. I, I should I should run. I have something to the table. 
So my, I have a, I want to take a question from the audience and, and kind of combine it with a, a question I want to ask both you and Ron. Someone asked um, if you or a person, someone of less means, uh, if do they have a chance to win an election, which I do think is an important question. And I want to then broaden that to- I live in a little mobile home. <laughs> Absolutely. It did not cost a lot to run. You just need to find people that support you and believe in you. Do not let finances be the challenge. There are people that are terrified of running for office. They will give you money because they don't want to do it. They will happily support you please, please, please run. Yeah, it's incredibly important to have a network who is willing to invest in your campaign. And it's not just money, it's also time because um, you got to do that organizing. You got to do the door knocking, phone calls. Um, and also it varies tremendously at the federal level. It's incredibly expensive to run for office. You go to the state level, it drops down local level. And then what you're running for at the local level matters. So a poor person can run at the local level and win, again, you just need a network of people um, who, who believe in your campaign, who are gonna put in the hours and a little bit of the finances and you can run for office and hold office. And at our website at the Center for Free Thought Equality, we have um, a little guide about running for office. Uh, we also have a guide about you know getting your uh, nonprofit group more involved in electoral politics because there's a lot that local groups can do in electoral politics and another guide on about how individuals can be more engaged in the electoral process um, up and up and including running for office. And I also wanted to mention a little bit, you were talking about, you know, uh, the bias against atheists and humanists. And, you know, that was something we were concerned about uh, with the PAC, you know, where we're gonna get a bunch of candidates attacked. And it really hasn't happened to my surprise. Uh, the only time that we've had that was Gail Jordan, who I think a lot of folks know, she was running in a really red district in Tennessee in 2016, she ran, religion never came up. Uh, the incumbent um, who retained the office took a job in the Trump administration. So Gail ran in a special election in 2017. And then she was, uh, uh, her religion came up. The Lieutenant governor, the head of the Tennessee GOP and her opposition brought up um, her religion and they hammered on it. And what was interesting at the end of the campaign, she actually got a higher percentage of the vote in this very red district than she did in 2016. So it really hasn't been an issue. So, um, you know, it doesn't mean that, you know, if you pick a race, it won't come up. But um, uh, to be quite honest, it hasn't been the, the issue that we thought it would be. That's great. And and um, I do want to also say that if for the person asking that question um, earlier about, you know, can can a poor person run? Not only can they, but they all the more reason that you should, you right? You to say, oh. Absolutely. That was the biggest difference in being able to campaign and, and tell someone, I know what it's like to apply for public assistance and be denied because I made $14 too much because I was offered some overtime that week. I know what it's like to, to prioritize your groceries over your medication or your co-pays and, and making those decisions, our voices are needed and it is critical. So I would focus less on what you don't have. Don't focus on the money you don't have, focus on your advocacy, focus on your connections, focus on uh, being able to find, depending on what state you're living in, um, there are organizations that, that collect data. So in California, I'm not sure if it's across the board, but there's political data incorporated, PDI, and I was able able to, um, on the app, pay, uh, after we paid for the data, be able to look at a map and canvas a neighborhood strategically to say, this person has voted in the last elections, this person's registered as a Democrat, they happen to, in their household, also have an independent and a Republican, but be able to make those talking points and say, I understand you. You are trying to represent people, and if you're in a neighborhood where there are other poor people, then this is why they need you, because there are people in sitting in the spaces that make generalized decisions about how you're just not working hard enough without understanding that it's twice as expensive to be poor, without understanding all of these challenges that are just not open to you until you have more means. It's a catch-22 in so many ways. And until people that have lived these collective experiences are able to sit at that table and say, no, I beg to differ, but I've lived the exact opposite of that. So I encourage you, you are needed. 
I, you are needed. Don't think, should I, but think, when will I? And, and especially women. Women need to be asked an average of seven times. Women will look at a job description and say, oh, I don't have that. I don't have that. I don't have that. A man will look at the same job description and say, Psh, I could learn to do that. So we need to stop change. We need to stop second guessing ourselves. We need to stop closing that door to ourselves before we even open that opportunity. So whether you think poverty is something that's excluded you from that, that just means that your life has been a lot harder than other people that have had opportunities presented to them. Don't let your status right now prevent you from seeking to represent others that have struggled in the same way you have. Absolutely. Thank, thank you. For Can you, you should run um, and you have resources, as Ron mentioned, you have resources in um, ex an existing network of secular and openly non uh, lawmakers like council member Keith and Nia, um, and mentioned the stigma is not as much as we think it is. Of course, it depends on your district, um, but we there's so much that has been so much progress we've made in, in acceptance. Um, and just by running, you can also continue to normalize non-religious folks serving. Um, so we do have just um, two minutes left here. So I want to maybe close by um, just asking you and Ron to share any other um, advice you might have for folks who are thinking about um, either running for office or how folks who maybe don't want to run for office, what is the best thing they can do to support um, elected officials like you, um, candidates? Um, what is the best way to get involved? What is your call to action for everyone listening? And I'll start with you, Council Member. My call to action is contact your elected officials and let them know what the issues that you're passionate about. There are times where as a council member, I can't say, hey, I've heard of some folks that want to do that. But if you call in and participate in the meetings, you speak up for other people that aren't shy. If uh, you don't want to do that, there's postcard campaigns. There are a million different ways to get involved, especially right now with the internet and Zoom. So even if you are in a very red area and you feel that you're in a little bubble, you can write postcards for another state. So you still feel like you're contributing to to greater democracy and greater equality even if you feel that you're in an isolated hub but there's a million ways to get involved don't count on someone else to do it a lot of us are kind of just thinking well it's only one vote or feeling that i i don't matter but we have seen the value of getting everyone engaged right now we're breathing a, a breath of fresh air every day that we see we're making steps towards equality we saw the transgender ban uh, re, you know um, reversed in the military so Every day we're feeling like, oh, it's getting better, it's getting better. But it means that we can't start to rest too easy. We have to ensure that we are, are pre-registering high school students to vote if we can. We have to hold the, the uh, voter drives across the board. We need to find ways to show people that you can make donations on Act Blue, even $5 a month, that these things start to add up because our voices are going unheard. And the rise of the evangelical right has, has created such disturbances. And we need to counter that actively by pushing for that separation of church and state. So if you, at a local level, it's a little less evident, but I think that our legislators are in a position to do that. So there's, there's ways to address separation of church and state with things like the fact that most states don't even have a minimum age for marriage. So there's things like normalized uh, abuse of children because they will force a child to marry their abuser with no minimum age. And so these things are considered a religious freedom act. But when you have six year olds, two year olds getting married to an adult to prevent the adult from going to jail, we, we have a, a very big problem. And when this is being normalized because religion, we have a call to action. People are being hurt and we can't allow that to go unanswered. Thank you so much, Ron. Do you have a, a, a closing call to action? Sure. And, and the engagement is the key. Even in a red state, please be engaged. Because what will happen is they've only been hearing one narrative this whole time. And if you're out there running for office, supporting candidates, there's another narrative. And you'll bring people out, get organized, and you'll change things. I live in Virginia. Um, you know, our legislature was controlled by the religious right for decades. Um, that's changed because People are running in every district, putting out that alternative narrative, organizing people and making things happen. Um, and with our community, we have to be engaged because we're growing and we have the power now because of our size that we can take on 
uh, the Christian nationalists. And, you know, if we get more engaged and more organized, we can bring their anti-science, racist, bigoted, misogynistic, xenophobic, homophobic, and anti-democratic crusade to an end. We really do have the power. We just have to be engaged. That's great. Thank you so much to both of you for joining us today. Um, unfortunately, we uh, due to technical issues, we weren't able to get Representative Salman, but just want to give a shout out to her because she's also a fantastic, amazing legislator uh, like you, council member. You're such an inspiration. Thank you for representing us. Um, you, you may be uh, a local official, but to all the folks across the country, you really do represent all of us. And um, I hope that some of the folks listening today will think a little bit uh, more seriously about running for office and engaging in what the council member Ron described. So thank you all uh, for joining. Thank you, council member. Thank you, Ron. I'm going to turn things back over to Well, thanks so much, Sarah. And uh, thank you for the panelists. Thank you so much, Ron. You've been a, a, an outstanding partner for us uh, here at American Atheists. Um, and while American Atheists is nonpartisan and, and we don't get involved in electoral politics, it's really um, we're really fortunate to have uh, great partners and friends uh, that are working on that side of uh, that side of the community and working on those issues. It, it, it makes such a huge difference. And I, I have to say, uh, this is the first time I've uh, I've heard from uh, the council member, and we were just I'm blown away. I think the folks in the chat, if you uh, scroll over there, you'll see some uh, some people who were just really inspired by um, a lot of what you were saying, and were very jealous of the folks who live in your district. So, um, you know, this is um, something that I, I think we all need to recognize uh, as engaged, active citizens in this country and, and in our local communities, that we can really make a difference. And I, I think that that there's just so much that can happen um, when, when you decide that you want to run and make a difference in your community. So um, I hope everyone will check out the resources that um, we've dropped in the chat and we'll, we'll take this to the next step. Uh, and, you know, uh, if people are concerned about uh, running and feeling uh, maybe that they aren't qualified or, or anything like that. I would certainly point to some of the current members of Congress <laughs> who are serving uh, that would disabuse you of the idea that you're not qualified. I think everybody who is here and an engaged person and thoughtful about you know what's going on in our country is someone who is qualified um, and, and a voice that's desperately needed right now. So um, this was just such an awesome panel and, and thank you so much for everyone, uh, for all of our panelists.